ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاهما بعد uh, Welcome to another uh, Q&A session on Tuesdays and today inshallah we will do a number of questions all of them related to uh, Salat al-Jumu'ah and the khutbah of Jumu'ah so I compiled a number of these so that we can inshallah dedicate an entire uh, Q&A today regarding the khutbah and I uh, wanted to begin with first question Sister Lisa from England, Manchester says that she has converted to Islam uh, but some of her close family and friends are questioning questioning her about uh, Islam being the true religion uh, because according to them, uh, the law of the Sabbath, the law of uh, the, the, the Jewish law of the Sabbath was given to all of Abraham's children. And so they question our sister Lisa that how can Islam claim to be following Ibrahim alayhi salam, following Abraham when we do not observe the laws of the Sabbath. So uh, the Jewish uh, Sabbath uh, or Shavat as they pronounce it, uh, it is uh, something that the Jews observe throughout the entire year on the seventh day of the week which is uh, Saturday. And according to the biblical tradition, it commemorates according to them the original seventh day that uh, God allegedly rested on after completing the creation. As you know in the Bible, uh, they believe, this is not something in the Quran, uh, they believe that uh, God created the earth in six days and then He rested rested on the seventh day. As for the Quran, there is no such thing. Allah does not need to rest at all. Allah does not get tired. But that is the biblical version. Uh, and so some of the basic teachings of uh, Judaism affirmed by the Sabbath are uh, God's act of creation, God's role in history, and most importantly, God's covenant with Israel. That's why our sister Lisa's uh, cousins and friends are confused that they believe that this covenant was for all of the believers in God. And this Sabbath is the only Jewish holiday uh, that is uh, mandatory by the Ten Commandments. So the original Ten Commandments, one of them was to observe the Sabbath. The, the Jewish people are obligated to sanctify and to honor the Sabbath at home and in the synagogue by observing the Sabbath laws and engaging in worship and study. And and the, the significance uh, of this day is reflected in many of their traditions of them. There's a famous tradition in the Talmud, which states one of the rabbis, their senior rabbi said, if you wish to destroy the Jewish people, abolish their Sabbath first. So in other words, if you don't have the Sabbath, then you are no longer a, uh, a Jewish person. And on this day, according to them, all types of work are banned. All that they're allowed to do is to basically be with family and to meditate or to uh, uh, read the scriptures uh, or to uh, praise you know, God uh, in a manner that they, uh, that they do so and that is not a day of work. No work is supposed to be done. So much so that uh, some of the more stricter interpretations say that you cannot even turn on or off a fire or turn on or off electricity uh, or uh, even use a cell phone, turn it on and dial the cell phone. So some of them are strict, very strict in this regard and there's a whole spectrum of you know what are they not allowed to do and what are they allowed to do. And the uh, some of them do, do not even drive cars uh, on that day uh, so they walk to the, the synagogue. Again this is the more ultra-orthodox version. Uh, and for them the Sabbath begins on uh, before sunset on Friday and it lasts until the stars appear on Saturday. So maybe around 29, 30 hours or so that before the sunset of Friday until the stars appear, which we would call Isha basically, of, uh, of uh, Saturday. And the time in this time it should only be spent in family and in prayer and in contemplation. Now, what do we believe about the Sabbath? What do we Muslims believe about the Sabbath? We firmly believe that the Quran, the Quran enjoined upon the Jewish people that they must observe the Sabbath. This is in the Quran itself. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, لا تعدو في السبت Do not transgress on the day of the Sabbath. Don't disobey the laws of Allah on the Sabbath. This is in the Quran. And in the Quran as well, we also have the story of a group of people who devised a trick to attempt to trick Allah that uh, they would put the nets of their fish, you know, on Friday daytime, and then they would pretend not to work on Saturday 
Saturday, but in reality, the nets are working on Saturday. And then they would capture the fish on Sunday and say, oh, we didn't actually do the work. But of course, the work was intended to be done on Saturday. And so Allah Azza wa cursed them. Allah's la'na came upon them. This is in the Quran. This is a Quranic story. However, we do not believe that the Sabbath was prescribed for all of mankind. This is the fundamental difference that our sister Lisa needs to understand. The Sabbath was enjoined upon the Bani Israel. It was something that Allah told them to do and they were supposed to honor it. However, it is not something that is enjoined upon anyone else. We do not have our holy day on Sabbath. That's not what our holy day is. And uh, we have explicit evidences in the Quran and in the Sunnah that that is not something that we need to follow. Allah says in the Quran, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا To each nation, I have given a different system of laws and a different methodology and way. The theology is the same. Allah is the same. The uh, belief in the judgment is same. Heaven and hell is same. But the details of the sharia and the details of how the rituals are to be done, this varies from civilization to civilization. And Allah Azza wa Jal enjoined upon some civilizations that which he did not enjoin upon other civilizations. And specifically, uh, with regards to the Sabbath, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nahl, verse 124, uh, that, fihi. We only ordained the Sabbath upon this community who they themselves disagreed about how it was to be done. السبتو, the, Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Saturday, was only intended did for that one civilization, but they themselves ended up disagreeing amongst themselves. They themselves did not honor it the way that it was supposed to be honored. They themselves tried to find tricks to get out of it. So Allah Azza wa Jal explicitly says in the Quran, the Sabbath was for the Bani Israel. It was not meant for the rest of mankind. And there's a very clear hadith in this regard as well, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, نَحْنُ الْآخِرُونَ السَّابِقُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ بَيْدَ أَنَّهُمْ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِنَا we are the last of the chronological uh, of these ummas, yet we shall be the first on the day of judgment, even though the people of the book came before us and they were given the book before us. And uh, this day that uh, was prescribed upon them, they differed over it and Allah Azza wa Jal chose us and guided us. And so they follow us. We have the right day and the, the, the Jewish people are one day after us and the Christian people are two days after us. This is a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he clearly says the original holy day was Friday. That was the default and Allah preferred us and Allah gifted us Friday. But they were given Saturday and then the Christians invented Sunday for themselves. So this is something that they, uh, the, the Christians did ask for the Sabbath, it was given to them by Allah, it's explicit in the Quran. So the point that we uh, need to emphasize is that the Sabbath, which was ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's true, we admit it. Yet it was not the original holy day in the calendar of Allah. The original holy day was Friday. And Allah blessed us with Friday. And for wisdoms and reasons known to Allah, He told the Bani Israel to observe the Sabbath. And the Christians, they actually invented Sunday completely. It was not something that Jesus came with. Jesus, of course, observed the Sabbath. Uh, but after He left this earth, His followers after Him, when they changed the religion, they added to this as well. So, to answer our sister Lisa, uh, we say that the notion that your relatives have that Sabbath was universal to all of mankind, frankly, it is incorrect. Perhaps it stems from their notion that whatever was given to the children of Israel was given to all of mankind. That is not the case. It was unique to the children of Israel. And for us, our holy day is not Saturday, it is Friday. And even on this day, we are not obliged to uh, uh, not do any work. Rather, Allah Azza diminish from us uh, the burden that was given to the previous nations. And the only thing that we are forbidden from doing is from the time of the Adhan up until the end of the prayer, that time frame only, we should not engage in trade or buying or selling or being a part of our work. We should leave everything and come to the masjid. So Allah Azza wa Jal made things easy for us. And he said only from the, and this is only for the men of this ummah, it is allowed for the women to do, uh, to, 
do what they're doing. But as for the men, when the Adhan of Jumu'ah is called up until the Salah finishes, we are not allowed to uh, be working in our jobs that uh, are for money or for rizq. We may do you know, manual labor to get to the, to the masjid. We may drive a car, no problem there. But we cannot be at a job for our rizq. And because of that, give up our Jumu'ah for no reason. This is not allowed. So Allah Azza wa Jalla blessed us to be on the correct day, which is Friday. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala knows best. Uh, continuing on our Q&A regarding all of the Fridays going to be today. Brother Abu Bakr from Minnesota emails asking that uh, he says that he works at a factory job and uh, he has long hours and sometimes he cannot take off extended period of times for Jumu'ah. And in fact, he is saying sometimes he cannot even take a shower before going to the Jumu'ah. So he is asking what is the minimum amount that he needs to do for Jumu'ah in order for it to be counted as Jumu'ah and that he does not get uh, into a lapse or a sin and uh, he wants to know what is the bare minimum and he also asks what are the some of the sunan and etiquettes if he has time to do this. Added to this as well, Sister Abida from Location Unknown emails saying that why isn't Jumu'ah obligatory for women? Why is it only obligatory for men? So uh, I'm going to begin with the second question because I actually found it a breath of fresh air that a lot of times some of our sisters are always asking about you know certain quote unquote privileges that men they believe have been given uh, and they don't have it. Why can't we? Why can't we? Sister Abid is saying, no, I want to also do more and I want to uh, be required for Jumu'ah uh, just like the men are required. And that is something that is a breath of fresh air because frankly, many times uh, in this uh, modern, uh, uh, you you know, as we know, this this uh, movement of feminism, when uh, people are renegotiating their rights and their roles and whatnot, too often some uh, people involved in this trend, they concentrate on what they deem to be privileges, as I have given a whole talk before this, they are not necessarily privileges, it is that Allah has given each what is suited to them. Uh, but very few of them want to be given the responsibilities. And so Sister Abida wants to be given extra responsibilities as well. Well, we respond to this by stating, uh, beginning with Sister Abid, we'll move to Brother Abu Bakr in a while. Uh, we begin to this by stating that there are textual reasons why Jumu'ah is not obligatory upon women. And there's also wisdoms. And so remember, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> remember that our Sharia is based upon textual rulings from the Quran and Sunnah. It is not based upon necessarily the wisdoms of those rulings. The wisdoms help us rationalize and understand. But sometimes the wisdom might not exist and the ruling still exists. We do not base the law of Islam based upon wisdom of an individual because wisdom can vary and sometimes be there, sometimes not be there. We do say that the default is that a ruling is wise for the majority of people. But that wisdom, that hikmah might not necessarily exist on the individual level in each instance, yet still the general ruling would still be applicable. So we can never equate the what is called in Arabic the illa or the cause with the hikmah or the wisdom. The two are separate and the ruling shall be based upon the illa, not upon the hikmah. The ruling is based upon the Quran and Sunnah or the uh, derivation factor, whether it's ijma' whether it's qiyas, and it is not based upon the wisdom. And I've given a number of examples for this in the past uh, and any student of usul al-fiqh can look this up. So the textual legislation, the reason why women are not uh, obliged to go for Jumu'ah is because there is explicit uh, traditions to this regard that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith in Abu Dawood, Al Jumu'atu haqqun wajibun ala kulli muslimin fi jama'atin illa arba'a. Jumu'ah is obligatory on every single Muslim who is living in a congregation, living in a city. He must pray Jumu'ah in jama'ah. He must pray Jumu'ah not by himself. There is no Jumu'ah by yourself. You must pray Jumu'ah in the congregation, but four people are excused, like the sick and whatnot and the traveler and one of them, the Prophet said, oh, Imra'a, a woman. So 
explicit hadith, which is an authentic hadith. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, women do not have to pray Jumu'ah. And because of this, there is no difference of opinion whatsoever uh, about this uh, ruling. The famous scholar of early Islam, Ibn al-Munzir. Ibn al-Munzir, he wrote one of the most famous treatises about ijma', about unanimous consensus. And he listed in this book, what aspects of Islam everybody has agreed upon with no exception whatsoever. And so point number 52, There is unanimous consensus. And this brothers and sisters is an evidence. Once you have unanimous consensus, it becomes binding. There is unanimous consensus that Jumu'ah is not obligatory upon women. And there's also unanimous consensus that if they attend of their own will, and they pray that that shall suffice them, and meaning they don't have to pray dhuhr in its stead. So there is unanimous consensus that Jumu'ah is allowed for women, but not obligatory for women. There is no difference of opinion, no two opinions about this. Now, some uh, later scholars, unfortunately, they went to uh, another extreme of discouraging women uh, from praying Jumu'ah. And this was based upon their own cultures and the reality of their times that women uh, would not leave their houses except for uh, necessities. And so this is their version uh, of, of what you know they feel should be done. As for the wisdom of why women were, uh, uh, were not obliged to pray Jumu'ah, the wisdom is that really, and this is the norm of most of, of human history, was that women were not expected to participate in communal activities frequently. It was a different time Time, a different culture, different norms, and generally speaking, women were kept a little bit more concealed for their own protection. That is the way it is. I'm not endorsing it as being right or wrong. I'm simply narrating it as a factual reality of the past that circumstances were different and men and women each had a role to play complementing the other. And generally speaking, the role of women uh, was not uh, was kept as minimal as possible for communal and public uh, affairs. And generally speaking, it was tried to be as domestic as uh, possible. Possible. And this is again a factual statement, and this is a reality for most of our history uh, that women played a more discreet role, not a public one. And therefore, the notion of obligating women to come for the prayer, even the daily prayer, some ulama said it is obligatory, and even men, some ulama said this is the minority opinion. Nobody said it is obligatory upon women to walk in the crowd and the hustle and bustle of the people and to be amongst the men and to be visible. Uh, they wanted to not make this a burden. Uh, uh, to, to make it obligatory. And so uh, they, uh, they did not make it obligatory upon women in this regard. Even Salatul Eid, the majority opinion is that it is not obligatory upon women, even though I follow the Hanbali school in this case, uh, the default of the Hanbali school, it is obligatory upon women, Salat al-Eid. Twice a year, they are obliged to go and pray with the community. And that's uh, the minority opinion which I actually follow. The majority opinion is that even Eid is not obligatory upon uh, them individually at the, at the individual um, level. That having been said, it's not obligatory. But if a woman is working a regular job, and hence she's already leaving the house and being active in, in uh, our, our modern societies, in this case, I mean, I cannot say it is obligatory, I cannot Billah, change the Sharia of Allah, but I can say that it makes no sense for her to then follow this concession and say, oh, it's not obligatory. If she uh, is able to, if it's reasonable for her to be able to pray in a masjid, I would encourage her. I cannot say more than this, that if she's going to work nine to five, she's going to a corporate America or a corporate you know, uh, place and she has a regular job and routine, then in this case, it is definitely good for her to once a week cut everything off and listen to a sermon, have her iman revived, be amongst the Muslim community. And so I will advise such a lady that if she is 
working a regular job that she should at least you know be encouraged to uh, pray Jumu'ah and uh, in that time frame she will be reminded you know of Allah learn something beneficial and be with the community and that's you know Allah knows best it's not wajib even in this case but I'm saying if she's going to uh, uh, be outside anyway then why not also uh, take advantage of Jumu'ah and uh, be a benefit and get some reward inshallah ta'ala uh, that is uh, the sister's question as for brother Abu Bakr uh, who is working uh, in the factory and he is saying that sometimes he has difficulty taking a longer break. He has to have the bare minimum to go and come back. So he's asking what is the bare minimum. So the bare minimum, dear brother Abu Bakr, when it comes to Jumu'ah is actually very easy. And that is that you must attend the entire khutbah beginning from when the Imam says, Assalamu Alaikum, until the Imam says, Assalamu Alaikum, Assalamu Alaikum, at the ending of the Salah. From the beginning of the khutbah to the end of the two rak'at, that section, the default is that it is obligatory and that if you are late to this then you have fallen short if you're late at least you have prayed the two rak'ahs of Jumu'ah but you have fallen short of what is the ob obligation it is obligatory it is wajib to attend the khutbah and the salah in case you are not able to really you are pressed for time and you are not able to come to the entirety may allah forgive you you should try your best to get time in america you have quite a lot of rights and privileges but even then i am aware that not all circumstances some jobs and some professions you cannot invoke religious freedom because of the nature of the job that you have to be there in a certain time and place so you try your best dear brother abu bakr uh, to attend the entire khutbah and the two rak'at if you are really not able to uh, and you are only praying the two rak'at, this is definitely uh, not uh, ideal and it will be less than what is obligatory, but it is better than leaving the two rak'at completely and praying dhuhr in your workplace. So I'm not saying it is permissible, but I'm saying in case, because I do understand and especially some jobs, uh, they are much stricter and they might just fire you and whatnot. This might be only a source of income. And by the way, as a general rule, this is to all the Muslims out there. If you are in such circumstances that you cannot go for Jumu'ah and you have tried and you're in a land where they don't allow Jumu'ah uh, or else you will lose your job. By the way, in America, it's difficult to do this. In America, generally speaking, you have certain privileges and rights to be able to get a little bit of extra try time or whatnot. They can work around this. But even in America, not all the time and not in all situations is this possible. If circumstances do not allow you to go for Jumu'ah whatsoever and you do not have enough of a critical mass in your own factory or whatnot to do a quick Jumu'ah because you can do Jumu'ah literally in you know five ten minutes you can you know go in a room and one person can read a three minute khutbah two minute khutbah you know and uh, uh, lead a two rak'ah salah if you have enough people three four five ten people you can do this in your local place if you're not able to pray in a masjid but if you're able uh, sorry so if you're not even able to do that and you are in circumstances that are really difficult that they're not allowing you any type of Jumu'ah then I ask you to try your best to find another job but until you find another job you are forgiven because Allah Azza wa Jal Allah is not going to tell you to live on the streets because you cannot pray Jumu'ah no Allah is Rahim and Rahman and Ghafoor and Allah Azza wa Jal understands your situation hate it in your heart don't like to be in that situation. Try your best to get another job. But in the interim and meantime, rather than be homeless on the street, you may work in such a job where uh, you cannot pray Jumu'ah, pray Dhuhr uh, at your local time uh, in, in the lunch break and whatnot. But try your best, as I said, to work around it and at least try to find, as I said, a Jumu'ah that is uh, close by where within the lunch break you can go and from Jumu'ah beginning of the khutbah to the end of the salah, try your best to do so. Now, as for other sunan of Jumu'ah, this is a well-known topic and I'm just going to summarize some things that no doubt our Prophet Sallallahu would wear a better garment, put on a perfume, uh, he would do ghusl. And by the way, ghusl does not have to be done right before you leave for the masjid. You may do ghusl even after Fajr of Jumu'ah. You may do ghusl in the early time of, of Jumu'ah, no problem. So 
you do a uh, ghusl, uh, it is sunnah to do, it is not wajib. Some scholars said it is wajib, but uh, actually no, it is not wajib, it is sunnah to do. And you should come early. The earlier you come to the masjid, the more rewards, but all of this is sunnah. And you can pray two rak'at as well, uh, or more than two, as many as you want to pray. And by the way, uh, the question regarding the number of sunan before and after Jum'ah is one which all of the four madhabs have a slightly different answer or opinion. So there's lots of different opinions about the sunan of Jumu'ah in terms of prayers. Uh, the position of the Hanbali school and Ibn Taymiyyah and others is that there is no sunnah ratiba before Jumu'ah and that after Jumu'ah either two or four may be prayed and should be prayed. So before Jumu'ah no sunnah ratiba after Jumu'ah, either two or uh, four, uh, depending on whether, again, these are very minor differences, and it's all Sunnah in the end of the day. No scholar says it is obligatory to pray before and after Jumu'ah. This is all, uh, what are the Sunan? Also of the Sunans of Jumu'ah as well, is that one should uh, recite Surah Al-Kahf as well, if one is able to do so. And there are other Sunnas you can read about them, but these are all perfections. You asked about the bare minimum, and so I have given you the bare minimum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy uh, upon you. You. Our next question, Brother Yusha emails from a city in Illinois in which there's only one masjid recently built and he says that they do not have a full-time imam and so the khutbas are given by selected people within the community. However, they have disagreed amongst themselves regarding the language of the khutbah. Some people are quoting, and then he mentions the name of a famous scholar who has a detailed treatise in English stating all of the evidences that it is obligatory to do the khutbah in the Arabic language. And this scholar, I'm not gonna mention names, has said that this is the majority opinion of the Islamic schools of law, and he says that it must be done. However, he allows a lecture in the local language that shall not be the khutbah, and then the khutbah be given in Arabic, and then the salah in Arabic. The brother uh, Yusha says, other people are saying that the khutbah should be given in English so that most of the people can understand. So uh, can I comment on this controversy? So uh, this controversy, um, again, this goes back to uh, early Islam and there is a famous treatise written that you have referenced. I don't like mentioning names for no reason. So this is a scholar that I respect and admire immensely. And he uh, definitely is one of the greatest uh, scholars of Islam alive today, most revered and respected. And he has large followings, especially in the Hanafi or Deobandi school tradition. And he has written a treatise about uh, the fact that Jumu'ah, the khutbah of Jumu'ah must be done in the Arabic language. And I have read this treatise multiple times actually. And it is a very scholarly, very erudite, evidence-packed uh, treatise. It is available in Urdu, English, and Arabic. And uh, this treatise is the standard uh, because of which so many of our uh, brethren of that, uh, uh, of that particular strand, uh, they insist that the khutbah must be given in Arabic, even though they allow a bayan, they call it before that in Urdu or in English. And so the people can listen to that, but the khutbah must be given in Arabic. And the main evidence, they have two main evidences, I'll summarize. Their main evidence, number one, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always gave the khutbah in Arabic. And he was the one who said, pray as you have seen me pray. So because he always gave it in Arabic, we must also give it in Arabic. And number two, they say this is the majority opinion of our earlier scholars. And they have a long list of scholars and this is many of the pages of this treatise are about Sheikh so-and-so says this and Imam so-and-so and lots of ulama of the past, you know, beginning from the second century all the way up until our times, lots of ulama have indeed said that uh, the khutbah should be given in the Arabic language. And this esteemed scholar who is one of the primary references of the Hanafi school, he also claims that the Hanafi school has been misunderstood and that the Hanafi school has always said that Arabic is the default for the khutbah and it is not allowed in any other language. Okay, so this is uh, what uh, our, this esteemed Sheikh has said. So the, the fact of the matter is that the controversy over khutbah and the language of the khutbah really goes back to all of the four Sunni schools of law. And it is true, factually, it is true 
that the majority of ulama did say that in cases where even one person can speak Arabic, that the khutbah must be given in Arabic. This is a majority opinion. In fact, so much so that uh, the majority of the Malikis and the Hanbalis said that even if none of them understand Arabic, the Imam can just read something incomprehensible in Arabic to him and whatnot, and that is the default that it should be uh, done. Uh, a second opinion says that if everybody in the audience is non-Arab, they don't understand Arabic. If everybody, not a small minority or a vast majority, if everybody in the audience does not understand Arabic, then in this case, the khutbah can be given in non-Arabic, in any language other than Arabic. And this is the default position of the Shafi'i school. And it is also some of the Hanbali scholars of the uh, past. And the third opinion is that it is mustahab to give it in Arabic, but not a condition. And if the khatib wants to give it in any other language, then he may do so. And this is allegedly the position of Abu Hanifa himself and some of the Shafi'i school. Now, our esteemed scholar of the Hanafi Madhab says Imam Abu Hanifa has been misunderstood. And that is his right to say he has been misunderstood. A factual point here, lots of ulama uh, have understood this from Abu Hanifa. So if our great scholar wants to say that all of these ulama have misunderstood, that is his right. But you should be aware that when you even read a Nawawi's books and other scholars and the, the people who write compendiums of fiqh, even modern compendiums of fiqh, the way they have understood Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala is actually pretty clear. And they feel that Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala did allow the khutbah in any language. So that's their position. And again, even what Abu Hanifa, how, what he said can be interpreted in different ways. Nonetheless, um, the default position of the majority of schools is that it should be given in Arabic. This is no doubt, that's a factual statement. However, is the majority position always the best one? Is the majority position always the better one to follow? And this is where, if you have listened to my Q&A throughout all of these you know, hundreds of Q&As that I've done, this is where I've always been bringing up this idea of I mean, the term, uh, a lot of people get very concerned when they hear it, but in reality, if anybody listens to my talk, there is nothing to be concerned about. When I say reform in understanding fiqh in our times, right? I've used this phrase multiple times. Perhaps there is an intentional shock in our intended. However, those people who either want to create controversy or don't understand, they read way too much in. When I talk about rethinking through fiqh, this is exactly what I'm talking about. These types of issues where there is no explicit commandment in the Quran and Sunnah. So the fact that, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu gave it in Arabic throughout his life, I mean, that's factually true. But just because he Sallallahu did something throughout his entire life in a certain way, it does not make it obligatory and binding on us, especially if he did it because it was the culture of his time frame. What if somebody said the only reason he did it was because that was his language, he was born into it, and the people spoke Arabic. And by the way, it is also factually true to state that for the bulk of Islamic history, the majority of the ummah understood Arabic. They could have been bilingual, trilingual, but they understood Arabic as a default. So if somebody were to say that the Prophet ﷺ did not command us to give the khutbah in Arabic, and he himself said, Islam will spread east to west. He himself said, I saw this whole world rolled up in front of me and Islam spread to every corner. He told us that Islam would reach the Roman Empire and other empires, he told us this. But he never said that make sure the khutbahs will remain in Arabic. What if somebody were to say that to derive that it is obligatory to give the khutbah in Arabic is a huge derivation. The max that can be said, it is mustahab and it is the default language. I agree. But to make it binding such that you will now say to a group of people who do not understand Arabic and they're coming to the masjid one time of the week, that's the only time they come to the masjid. And you will say to this community that I'm sorry, but because our classical ulama said, a majority of them by the way, not even all, that it should be in Arabic, that we will give it in Arabic. We will say, this is what I'm thinking about when I'm saying we need to rethink through just because a large group said it, we have to look at our context and look at our situation. What is the goal of the khutbah? Allah says in the Quran, 
O you who believe, when the call for Jumu'ah is given, leave buying and selling and come and listen to the remembrance of Allah. The remembrance of Allah is not in any one language, it is in the language that they understand. As Allah says in the Quran, we have not sent any prophet except that he speaks the language of his people. We have not sent any prophet except that he speaks the language of his people. So those who are following in the footsteps of the prophets, that's every khatib and every shaykh and every alim following in the footsteps, they should follow that verse in the Quran as well, that they speak to the people in their own language. And by the way, here is the irony and again, I always preach tolerance and respect, and I respect the position that it should be given only in Arabic. But I gently, gently, without any attempt to mock or ridicule, push back and I say, you have said that you want to follow the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ by keeping it in Arabic, okay. But you have also instituted two khutbas. You might not call it a khutbah, you can call it a bayan. But in reality, there are two khutbas taking place separate and distinct. You have the bayan in the local language, and then you have the khutbah in Arabic. Where is following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ there? He did not do so. In fact, one can point out that there is an authentic hadith in Abu Dawood in which a Prophet ﷺ forbade gathering in the masjid uh, for any communal activity before Jumu'ah. You may gather individually, pray salah. There should be no communal activity of halaqat and, and, and uh, knowledge and whatnot. It should not be done before the khutbah. Our scholars say, because we want to concentrate on the khutbah. Therefore, don't have something before the khutbah. This is a hadith. Do not have halaqa before uh, Jumu'ah, meaning don't have, you know, uh, circles of knowledge and whatnot and, and mo'idha before the khutbah because attention span is limited. So if you're going to give a 30 minute lecture before the khutbah, then you're going to have the khutbah. Nobody's going to pay attention to the khutbah. But see, our brethren who want to be strict on the sunnah, very literal, in order to be strict, they had to be non-strict. They had to institute something that goes against the sunnah and actually contradicts an explicit hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood. And this shows us that really it doesn't make any sense. With utmost respect, I'm not trying to be dismissive here, but to be so literalist in this regard that just because a majority said it, no, even if a majority said it, times were different, places were different. We now have a crisis going on. People are barely praying. They're barely coming to the masjid. They come only for Jumu'ah. Some of them don't even come for Jumu'ah. They're gonna come for that 15, 20 minutes. The only time they have to be educated. And because you want to stick with tradition, and that tradition is man-made. Allah did not say the khutbah must be in Jumu'ah. The Prophet did not say it must be in Jumu'ah. It is something they have derived. That derivation was contested from day one. Earlier scholars, some of them said the khutbah can be in any language. And that's the position that I'm advocating as well. So when I say we need to rethink through uh, books of fiqh, this is exactly what I mean. We are not bound to the opinions of earlier people just because they said them. We live in different times and places. And as I have said many times, we find an entire spectrum of people in our times, some of them are ultra literal and, and, and sticking to what their schools taught them. And I respect them. And I say that I understand their concern, but that's not going to help Islam. Sometimes it will make Islam dogmatic and fiqh will become dogmatic. Others on the flip opposite, the far left, they want to rethink through everything. And these are the progressive movement of Islam. They don't have any attachment to the tradition. They don't really care about the sunnah uh, very much. That is also a destruction of Islam. I have always said that myself, I am with the middle group of scholars, the Wasalti type of scholars that they respect the tradition immensely, but they are not blind to the realities of the world we live in. And they contextualize and they discern and they think more deeply and they say, okay, why did our previous scholar say this? Was it something Allah and His Messenger said? Or was it for reasons that we can now rethink through? And when it comes to the language of the khutbah, I think it is obvious that uh, the Quran and Sunnah does not restrict the language of the khutbah. And this is exactly what the vast majority of that type of scholarly community has said. Uh, the Majlis, uh, the Majma' al uh, the Majma' al Fiqhi, which is the Majma' that I quote the most often, uh, which is uh, uh, following the Rabat al Alam al Islami, one of the largest bodies of Muslims in the world, uh, that they they gave uh, their, their fatwa in their fifth uh, annual meeting. This is back in the early 80s, many 35 years ago or something. Uh, one of the first meetings that they had, they said,
said that uh, the khutbah of Eid and the khutbah of Jumu'ah uh, in the lands in which people do not speak Arabic may be given in their local languages. It is not necessary uh, that the khutbah be given in the Arabic language. It is not necessary that it be given, rather it should be given in whatever will facilitate them learning Islam. It should facilitate their learning of Islam. Uh, and even the translation of the Quran may be said during the khutbah in their local language, but of course the Quran should be recited in Arabic only. So, and this is their fatwa, that even when Quran and Hadith is quoted in the khutbah, it's not obligatory, they're saying, to mention it in Arabic. It can be done, uh, uh, it can be done in any language, but they said that uh, obviously uh, the when you recite the Quran that it must be in the Arabic language. So this is the fatwa from uh, Al-Majma' Al-Fiqhi. And also the Hayat uh, Kibar which is the, the Fatwa Council of Saudi Arabia, uh, which is generally on the stricter side in most issues. In this issue, they said there is no evidence from the Quran and Sunnah to restrict the language of the khutbah, and it can be given in any language that will be the most benefit to the people. The same goes for uh, the Egyptian Council and the Jordanian Council. So basically, the default of the majority of Muslim councils of the world, they have said that the khutbah can be given in any language. It is really primarily our uh, Hanafi brethren of today, and of of course, this is the irony, and I'm not uh, uh, a part of that, uh, you know, movement, so I'm not qualified to speak too much. But I will say that it is obvious to an outsider that the earlier Hanafis were different than the modern ones in our homelands, and there's marked differences in many fatawa. And many of the earlier Hanafis would allow certain things that later ones do not allow. And this one seems to be the case that Imam Abu Hanifa, and Allah knows best, it seems that he did allow khutbah in any language, uh, but he said it is better to give it. In Arabic. But later Ahnaf, uh, they said it must be given in Arabic and this includes some of the students of Abu Hanifa. Nonetheless, um, even if that is the Hanafi school, uh, it is uh, one school and the other schools are more open in this regard. And this is what I mean when I say we need to rethink through fiqh in our times. We need to uh, reform the books of fiqh, not the Allah's Sharia. We cannot change Allah's Sharia. But it is not Allah's Sharia that the khutbah must be given in Arabic. This is something that later scholars have derived. And therefore, uh, dear brother uh, Yusha, who asked this question, I say that it is my humble opinion, which is the opinion of uh, the majority of fiqh councils. In fact, dare I say, I'm not aware of any global fiqh council. I repeat, I'm not aware of any global fiqh council. When I say global, I mean composed of ulama from multiple countries who have given a fatwa that is uh, anything different than what I have said, which is the khutbah should be given in the language that is of maximum benefit. And therefore here in North America, uh, perhaps 10% understand Arabic, 15% understand Arabic, whereas pretty much 99%, if not 100% in some communities understand the English language. So we should give the khutbah in the language that people will understand. And this means that it is completely allowed to give the khutbah in the English language. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And with that, inshallah wa ta'ala, we will We'll uh, stop here for today and continue next week. Until then, Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>